I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of the world of work right now and how people are experiencing that. I think that there's just dramatic changes right now happening to people's ability to support themselves because of AI. And I think that is very scary. And I think there's, you know, a lot of proposals about how we might mitigate that with like universal basic income or something like that. But in my mind, these are all just kind of far off fantasy concepts that's missing the reality of what's happening right now, which is that people are losing their livelihoods and their jobs right now today. I'm Alexis Hope. I'm a co-founder and head of product for a company called Focused Space. Uh, we help people accomplish their goals with a variety of different tools, but at the heart of it are um, these live sessions where people come together with other people from around the world and they work silently but together on their own things. And that just sort of shared presence and accountability is actually magic for people that struggle with motivation um, and getting things done. So uh, yeah, it's a very, a very human technology company in this age of AI. How did you come up with this idea and um, and where do you, what is the, the purpose of it for people? Yeah, yeah. So Focus Space actually started as an in-person thing before the pandemic. So my co-founder, uh, she kind of had this experience uh, at a coffee shop that maybe many of us have. She was there working on stuff and she realized that she was able to get a lot more done by just being in the presence of other humans. At the same time, she was also getting distracted by the, the loud banging of the espresso machine, people's cute dogs and like eavesdropping and all that. So she created having a space where she could, you know, have that magic of being around other people, but with a bit more structure. So she rented out yoga studios part time during the day and at night and, and brought in tables and chairs. And it was kind of like an adult study hall vibe. And then of course with the pandemic, you know, she had to shift her operations online and the way the world worked changed super dramatically um, that year. And with the rise of remote work and flexible work and the rise of freelancing and solopreneurship. So our product just started to evolve to kind of fit this new world of work. And we've been evolving ever since because work has changed dramatically, including with the, the advent of the rise of AI um, lately. So it's been pretty interesting times. Okay, you've described Focus Space, the company you co-founded and had the product and community department of, as an antidote to toxic online mm. spaces. What do you think people are really craving in digital communities right now? Yeah, I think people are craving online spaces where they don't feel surveilled all the time, where they don't have to police their own emotions or reactions. I think a lot of places people hang out online, social media, and so forth, people have the very real impression that their information is being harvested at all times, or even just being, you know, watched by their employers or others. So there is quite a pressure to put on a facade or, you know, a, a mask in front of how they actually feel. So I think one of the things that people like about the space that we're building is that they do feel like they can be a little bit more authentic and messier and vulnerable and expect that that humanness is valued in the space and that they will receive it in turn from other people. So it just feels more real, more authentic and just not surveilled. And we are, you know, very serious about not surveilling our members. It's very important to us. And why is that important? It's important for ethical reasons. We're not trying to build a machine that extracts people's data and tries to sell them things and make them feel bad about themselves. So as a designer, that's just not something that I want to participate in building. But also, I think that creating spaces where people can feel authentic and vulnerable and human is what actually makes it work because people like don't mm. feel motivated. They don't feel um, safe and supported if they don't feel like they can actually show up with the mess that is being human, so it's just important. Yeah, and you've talked about resisting the search for perfect productivity. What's a better question we should be asking instead of how can I get more done? Yeah, I think a lot of people are asking, like, how can I get more done because their employers are asking them, how can you get more done? How can you justify, you know, your role here? And I think people themselves are, you know, so yes, they're asking, how can I get more done? But I think we should all be asking, how can we learn as we are doing things? 
um, how can I enjoy my job and my life more? How can I feel like I'm contributing to the world and to my team and the people that I work with? I think all of these are better questions to ask and it makes sense why people are so efficiency focused when their employers are pushing them to be, but I think the employers should work to shift their culture towards these bigger picture questions and that in the end will help them get more done and it will help them get more done in terms of things that matter. And help them keep their people. Yes, yeah, yeah, keep people motivated and happy and wanting to show up every day doing their best. Like that really gets lost with the push for efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, and so the more advanced AI becomes, the more we begin to outsource various aspects of our lives to it. And we recently discussed how AI is being used as a validation machine, um, especially when building communities and connections. Why do you think live human connection is becoming even more important as AI tools become more sophisticated? Yeah, I think um, I was reading that like one of the top three use cases for chat GPT right now is, is therapy and, and a lot of those kinds of things. I, I think, you know, for some group of people, AI and AI chatbots will unfortunately be the most validating and supportive voice in their lives. Um, but for other people, I think that they will start to see through that and realize that they're being pandered to by chatbots. And so they will start to value talking to fellow humans who might actually tell them the truth or be willing to tell them hard things and not always say, that's a great idea, you should do this, which I think you know, AI is wonderful at validating every idea we, we have, but validating our ideas can either be you know, not useful at the very least, all the way up to downright harmful to society at the worst. So that's kind of the spectrum. Do you think then that that's going to make having relationships, being actually in relationships with humans more difficult then? Yeah, I, it's, yeah I've definitely heard um, some of my younger friends talking about how, or kind of worrying that the way that they talk to AI has influenced how they talk to their friends and people in their lives. So I think people are, are you know, wondering whether or not it's impacting how we show up for others in our lives because you know, the people, people are so messy, in, including ourselves. Um, and so I think um, we, if we lose our tolerance for the mess and the challenge that comes with building human relationships, we're also gonna miss out on the, the good parts of genuine connection and support and, and love, frankly. Like, you're not gonna get love from your chatbot, even though a lot of people are trying. Yeah, so in your experience, what kind of dangers or negative impacts have you witnessed when individuals favor designing work environments that optimize for efficiency at the cost of human connection? Yeah, I think what I've seen happen to the culture of work, what a lot of our members talk about is kind of like productivity theater. Uh, I think there's a similar concept around security theater, like all of these things that we do at the airport that don't actually make us necessarily safer, they just feel like it. The same concept can be applied to productivity. So, you know, now you, your, your AI can write your emails for you and then your, your AI can read the emails and summarize them for you. And you can do all these things that, you know, give us dopamine and make us feel like we're doing more. But are we really doing more? Are we accomplishing what matters? And so one of the things that, that really inspired me to work on focus space was to help people think every day, like what's actually gonna move the needle? What actually matters today? And what's just distraction and noise? And I think, you know, just in our, our climate of many digital technologies trying to steal our attention and compete for that, it's more important than ever to think about like what actually matters every day. Uh, so AI, AI harms, evolving like how like what kind of you know because coded bias talks and algorithm justice league talks a lot about ai harms yeah. um i think you've answered this in a number of different ways but like in your perspective what are the ai harms how are they evolving and like what should we be looking out for i spent a lot of time thinking about kind of the world of work right now and how people are experiencing that and i think some of the harms that i see ai causing in those spaces are everything from you know increased demands on people's productivity, uh, the assumption that every job can be replaced with AI, 
Uh, I see a lot of creatives in our community, especially really grappling with, you know, the, the fact that AI is, is not doing like kind of boring manual work, but actually taking over like the essence of what they care about and what they're doing. Um, and frankly, just being worried that they're going to lose their job and not have um, access to supporting themselves anymore. So I think that there's just dramatic changes right now happening to people's ability to support themselves because of AI. And I think that is very scary. And I think there's you know, a lot of proposals about how we might mitigate that with like universal basic income or something like that. But in my mind, these are all just kind of far off fantasy concepts that's missing the reality of what's happening right now, which is that people are losing their livelihoods and their jobs right now today. And that is not showing any signs of stopping. And then their purpose. Yeah, and their purpose altogether. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any last words before we wrap? I think a lot of people are having com conversations about potential harms and questioning whether or not we should be shoving AI into everything. And as somebody who's working in the technology field, I see, certainly see like lots of investors pushing AI narratives on shaping companies and what products are coming out. But if you listen to actual users of technologies, they will tell you that they don't actually want that. So I think what I'm hoping to see is like more technology founders being honest with themselves and really designing their products and services in partnership with people who are using them so that they can really understand like when might an AI tool be genuinely useful for someone? And when is it like exactly the opposite of what people want? And so I hope to see more kind of honesty and self-awareness and more um, products driven by the people that use them versus investors and capital. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping to see that. <laughs>